It is Wednesday, August 24th, 2022. This is another edition of Baseball Today. That is my man, the ace on the mound, the third baseman over there, the guy who hit 106 homers. He was the best two-way player coming out of uh, high school in 2004, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose. We've got producer Rob along for the way as well. As you can see, I'm on the road yet again. Took the family to San Diego to see our oldest son, Josh. And then we took in a Guardians 3-1 win over the Padres. Represent guards. The AL Central leading guards. Yeah. Put right. some respect on that name, man. We'll be back at the game uh, that wraps up two quick two-game series this afternoon. I'll be wearing my Cleveland against the world. Oh, shirt. gosh. Yeah. You know, the the Rams move into their new home. They win the Super Bowl. The Guardians change their name. They win the World Series. That's what everyone is saying right now. Hey, settle down. Let's slow that okay. roll just a little bit. All right. Be great to hear. But I uh, did get to see some John Boy Media fans out there last night. That was very, very nice. A lot of people stopping, saying, hey, you know, talking about how much they love the content, which is a good deal. We love that. Saw a lot we of try. You know, we, we had a lot of uh, Guardians roll through the um, Arizona Spring Training House. So we got to see Tristan, mm -hmm. McKenzie, Richie Palacios, Will Benson. All three played in our ping pong tournament. Will Benson whooped my ass in the ping pong tournament. Yes, he did. That was not even, that was like, someone set that up to make me look bad. And I'm going to ah. find out who one day. Jeez, yeah, was, man. So it was nice to see all those guys. Um, and they all give, give you shout outs and a lot of love. All right, let's get to it. Unexpectedly, Fernando Tatis Jr. stepped in front of the mic yesterday at Petco Park. For the first time since receiving a PED 80 game suspension, he sat next to Padres general manager AJ Preller, showed some remorse. Let's hear how he did. I'm truly sorry. I am. I have let so many people down. I've seen how my dream, my dreams, have turned into my worst nightmares. A couple of days, a couple of months. But there's no other, other one to blame than myself. I have made a mistake. And I regret every single step. How did he do? I thought he did pretty good. It seemed like he was genuinely remorseful. Now, that could be for a couple reasons. People are going to say, well, he's remorseful. He got caught. Um, I'm going back and forth on this because I can see how it could be an honest mistake. If he did have something he wanted to get treated and he just didn't run a medication by a doctor, it sucks that he's going through, will have to go through all this the rest of the of his career just because he didn't call in something to his team doctor. But it is that easy to do it. It's that easy to do it. The thing I think that he did best I know he has to address the media. He has to address the fans. I think he's sounded remorseful in that session right there when he was sitting on the bench. Or you should have been there talking to him. Uh, but he had to address his teammates before. So I guess he spent 20 minutes answering uh, questions in front of his teammates. And if you remember, the first couple of days, his teammates came out and they were pretty harsh on him. Like they were saying, you're, you've disappointed us twice now. And they kept just saying, hey, he hasn't been here all year. Who cares, basically, is what they were saying. And then after he had this meeting, you know, they were a little more forgiving. And, you know, Musgrove came out and kind of his support. Uh, Machado had some words. And I think that was important for him to do. And he understands now it's a long, long road back. Um, when you see his face, I'm usually a pretty good judge at stuff like this. It, it does seem like he's just overwhelmed. One of his quotes was, my biggest dream turned into a nightmare. And he knows that he's going to have to figure a way to earn all that trust back. He's never going to get back. This is the bottom line. And, you know, I feel bad saying this, but it is the truth. He's never going to get back to where he was prior to him getting suspended. Top of the game, top of the world, everyone loving him. It's just not going to come back because there's going to be people forever who are just going to say you cheated. And now whether that's the case or not, you know, honestly, we'll probably never know, Chris. Like, I look into his eyes. I feel like he is truly remorseful. It seems like he just made a mistake. But again, we'll never be 100% positive on that. So I think he did a good job. Got a ways to go. I mean, and I told you this from day one. The only way to come back and to, and to win back the fans and, like, his teammates is to go out there and ball out, dude. 
That's really the only way you can apologize. You can say all these dang things as much as possible, but if you go out in the field and you're not the same player, then that's it, man. No one's getting like, you just won't get back what you have. So let's hit the fast forward button about five years from now. There's always going to be a certain percentage of people that will never forgive him. They'll always look at him first and foremost as a cheater and nothing else regardless of the explanation okay there's there's always that percentage of people that you can never appease no matter what you do he could help old ladies across the street every day for the rest of his life and people would still look at him and say no cheater that's it um i think that most people sit in the in the middle of this thing like most of us aren't buying his story um here's the thing i think i I struggle with on a personal level. I went to the game last night with my 21 year old son and I look at him and I talk with him and I love him dearly. And there's still some things that fall out of his mouth that he does, or he says, I'm like, huh, wait, what? Like, how do you see the world that way? And we also forget that Fernando Tatis Jr. is 23. He is a kid. And so it's 23, a kid. He's 23, a kid. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're still. You got, I, mean, you, I guess you is, got more experience than that with with your yeah, sons, because your but. brain is. Uh, I mean, go study the science. Your brain as a young man is not fully developed until like twenty five or twenty six. I know that. Now, I, I know that doesn't I, mean you can't. That doesn't mean you just make bad decisions all the time. I'm not excusing them. Okay. And this is this is an important discussion because this is what I'm telling you. I'm struggling with that. I don't think I see it fully as black or white at this point. So I still think that there's, you know, and some people are probably listening to this saying, nope. You know, he's it's 100 percent his fault. I mean, ultimately, as an adult, when you're over 18, you are responsible for whatever decisions you make. And, um, you know, I go back to what Mike Clevenger said the day that we found out that he that Tatis was suspended. He goes, this is the second time we've been disappointed. And let's remember, Mike Clevenger hasn't exactly been the pillar of responsibility in his major league <laughs> career either. So when guys like that are saying shit, you, you kind of take a big step back. You're like, whoa, OK, all of a sudden. Um, I just want him to, to learn a lot from this. I want him to learn the responsibility of being a $340 million ball player. I want him to learn the responsibility of being, whether you think you're a leader or not in a clubhouse, that's an important thing. And I just have to tell you one thing at the game last night, I was remember when this first happened, I said, I'd be curious to see how many 23 jerseys there are. There were a lot last night. And they were doing like a fun little video board thing where they're showing people that are doing different things. And the last guy had a Tatis jersey on. He spun around. And on top of the 23, instead of Tatis Jr., it said with duct tape written on, with marker written on it, suspended till. And then it said 23. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) The whole place let out a huge groan. And it was unbelievably, unbelievable daily timing. Oh man. You know, I guess you're right. Look, he's 23. I've said that before. I understand that the human brain is not fully developed until you're 26, whatever. But you still know right from wrong. And a couple of these things are so ridiculous. Like riding a motorcycle, Chris, as soon as you sign a professional contract, you understand you got to you can't do that. You can't risk your body on something for what? To get a little thrill out of riding a motorcycle, hey, go to the local arcade, bro, and play a video game with the motorcycles if you need that. I don't know, man. Like, you just can't be doing stuff like that. That actually, if 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 this ringworm medication story is true, the motorcycles piss me off more. Because, like, you're doing nothing for yourself, at least with the medication you're trying to cure your body or something. This is just you being stupid and having fun, dude. And like I don't want to, I don't want to like pile on the family, but your dad is a was a major league baseball player. He understands all of this, okay? Like, but he didn't have an unblemished record either. I know, but learn from learn from your parents' mistakes, man. You know, and and dad needs to be there after the motorcycle incident. Needs to be like, what are you doing? You have the world by the balls right now. You can't be doing stupid stuff. Everything you do, whether you like it or not, you have a responsibility to your city, to your team. Yeah. To a lot of different people, when they hand you that type of money, man, you, it's the, it's the, you got to grow up. Whether you're ready to grow up or not, you got to grow up because now, I mean, you're essentially like an executive at a fucking major corporation, a billion dollar corporation. It's like you're a quarterback 
in the NFL. It's just different. The rules are different. You have to be, you're going to be judged differently. Just on a personal front, I'm, I'm asking you, do you think you will ever look at Fernando Tatis Jr. five, eight, 12 years down the line and not think about this? Um, in, in moments, yes. Big moments of like, man, if he's going and, and balling out like he was, I'll say that's a great baseball player right there. But it'll always be in the back of my head. I, and there's a lot of guys in the league that are like that. Like Nelson Cruz gets a pass from everyone because he's good. Totally. He's been doing it for a while. But you know what? Every time they mention him, I'm like, you know what? There's something there. So he can get past it to a certain degree. But this is always going to follow him. And he knows that. And that's what he's talking about when he well, says, my biggest dreams have turned into my nightmare. I, I think it's just because of his stature in the game. Like Nelson Cruz is a really good player. He was never a superstar. The only people we look at in this light Barry Bonds, Ryan Braun, Fernando Tatis Jr. These are guys who were not. Alex just, Rodriguez, don't forget. Alex Ra Sorry. Sorry, because I'm trying to block him out. But yes, exactly. What do they all have, all have in common? Superstar status, not just really good players. So there you go. Real quick. I, yes. Do you think if he just did the Andy Pettit? And was like, fuck it. I'm going to get suspended anyway. Might as well just change my story. What if yeah. he just said, hey, I thought this was going to get me back on the field. I, I wanted to get back with my boys. Do you think that would have been better than him saying, talking well, about this ringworm story? Uh, Andy Pettit had a ton of goodwill equity built up in the media. That's why that story never took off. And because Roger Clemens was the heel of the story, right? Everybody could push their venom in that direction and be like, well, what a dick Roger Clemens was. And look at this. So Andy Pettit was like this little minutia there. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand why that story was never bigger than, I don't know. I, he was a good guy. And had throughout the crawl. league right now, we're seeing a ton of second chances, dude. I mean, look at AJ Hinch. They couldn't wait to hire AJ Hinch. The Red Sox couldn't wait to hire Alex score. The only one that really got the short end of the stick on that whole thing was Carlos Beltran. But right. although he's doing TV now, like, like, so like he's going to be okay in this game. He's going to be able to, obviously he has to finish out his contract play. Like he's going to have the opportunity, Chris, to change the narrative. Uh, it's all going to be based off his numbers though. Bottom yep. line. All right, let's stay in Southern California. Uh, apparently Artie Moreno is looking to get out of the baseball business. Uh, he has been, he has owned the team for the last two decades he has poured a lot of money into it. There has not been the success on field to match it. I suppose well, they're hoping that they'll have a new buyer, perhaps by the beginning of the 2023 season. If that happens, do you think it makes it more or less likely that Shohei Otani is an angel next season? I spoke about this a little bit on Talking Baseball, and this, we're just kind of reacting to this in real time. My thoughts are still fluid on it. But I believe that if you're a prospective owner and you're looking to buy the Angels, I, I'd i want the choice of what to do with the next, like Babe Ruth, essentially. Like I'd want the choice to say, hey, I want Shohei or hey, we can trade Shohei away for a, a, a package. I'd want the choice in that. I, I, I don't think it makes the Angels more appealing to a buyer to trade Shohei Otani. Like that doesn't make any sense to me in a business mind whatsoever. I get clearing the books. He's going to make, you know, whatever he's making in 23, then he's a free agent. So like, I, I just think having him there keeps the valuation of the team at what it is, or it increases it. Like if he's out of there, like, I don't think that team is worth as much. Like this guy is a superstar, an international superstar. So I think that makes it more likely that he's there in 23 if they're trying to sell this team. I agree of wanting the choice. Um, because worst case scenario, probably... Chris, like he's gone in 23 or after 23. So then the owner can get that off the books. There's there's no yeah, reason the, to trade okay. him. The worst case scenario is that the first thing people remember about your ownership is you let Shohei Otani walk for a compensatory pick. How's that sound? Not great. Not, not, uh, how about the worst, worst avenue ever? At least if you trade Shohei Otani in the offseason, what do you think they would get? Like Mookie Betts 
got Alex Verdugo and Jeter Downs, and I think they got a catcher in the deal, right? So they got an everyday outfielder who's a solid player, a kid who hasn't made a blip on the radar yet, and a guy we haven't heard from for one of the best players in the sport. I get it, Shohei's different because you're getting an ace at the top of your rotation and a guy you can plug into the two-hole, something we've never seen. So what do you think in the offseason Shohei would get? Fetch. I still think he fetches a, a mighty haul. I really do. Exactly. What if he gets traded at the deadline next year? It's Is still it a pretty close? big haul. Obviously, not the same, Chris, because now he's now he's a rental for a couple months. Um, I still think he demands a haul. I don't know if I'm if I'm an owner coming in. I think you want Mike Trout and you want Shohei Otani. They're not the problem, dude. Like the Angels haven't had like an absorbent payroll. They haven't, dude. Like, they need. I think I, think I saw one seventy three is what it topped yeah, out. Yeah, that's so. Like, they're not even close to the you know luxury tax thresholds, whatever we call them, um, the competitive balance tax. Excuse me. So, like, they haven't been the problem in the organization. So, like, you want them in the organization. They've helped your organization. It's the surrounding players around them, namely the pitching. So, I don't think he gets traded, unless. Artie Moreno decides not to sell the team. Then maybe he could get traded. I think he, I think he stays. I like your your point about the ownership flexibility. Um, but boy, they're going to have to do this in a hurry. They're, I mean, whoever the new owner is, the earliest they get is at the beginning of next season. And then how much are they real? The biggest problem with Moreno is that he, he was in too much on everything into you know he didn't hire the right baseball people so he felt like he had to meddle all the time owners the best owners are the ones who financially and emotionally support your baseball people those are the best ones and even though Artie Moreno didn't stop spend top dollar he spent yeah he just never spent the right way not once did it he seem get like on a deal where he's where you're like bingo yeah, it seemed like they were going after the flashy object quite a bit. The big old flashy, splashy sign. And, you know, yeah. that sometimes it, those help, but you got to supplement. I know. But in fairness, like when when Josh Hamilton went there for 125 and when C.J. Wilson went there for 90, and C.J. Wilson gave him a couple of good years, um, and Anthony Rendon for 245, we were all, none of us were like, what are you doing? We were all like, okay, they're going for it. Heck, even Zach Cozart, who got, I don't remember what it was, 40 million. 30 was an all star. Yeah, all star player in Cincinnati. And that was a bomb. Like, it just seemed like whenever the Angels tried, it fucking blew up in their face. Dude, think about this. Think about this. They signed all those guys. And the problem was so glaring with their roster over the years that a new GM came in and spent every draft pick on pitchers 20 <laughs> motherfucking picks all on pitchers that tells you like he came in and was like guys how do you not see the problem here i i think that's overlooked man okay. baseball today it's presented to you by our friends over at mugsy the most comfortable men's jeans on the planet built with proprietary stretch denim the jeans look stylish mm but feel like you're wearing sweatpants. I can tell you, now I've been a guy who's gone up and down in weight. The thing I Dow love Jones. about Muggsy Jeans, I'm a Dow Joneser, is that they feel great no matter you're at the weight you want to be at or if you're a little heavier, that's okay because the jeans go with you. Um, you got plenty of comfort south of the equator, so your boys are, are feeling good. There's more room for those. If you got thick thighs, kind of like I do, they feel good. They're not too clingy. And then, it, you know, how you get like that ass sweat if everything's like, yeah, you do. No, you don't no. understand that problem. Guys built like me, we do. So you don't get any of that. They fit great. They look great. Michelle tells me whenever I put on my gray mugsies, she's like, those look perfect with what you're wearing. And she can be a tough critic when it comes to, you know, what I'm wearing. So they feel good. They give you plenty of room. They're jeans that move with you and not against you. So do your legs a favor. Head on over to Muggsy.com to pick up a pair of the most comfortable clothes ever worn. That is Muggsy.com. For 10% off your entire order, you use the promo code JOMBOY. That is JOMBOY, 
at Mugsy.com. Save your 10% today. Feel great. And they've got an array of colors, which is really, really good for your wardrobe. We continue on. Yankees swept the uh, back end of the Subway Series. So Yanks win the two in the Bronx. Mets won two earlier this year in Queens. Do you think, look into your crystal ball, is a Subway Series World Series the best matchup we could have for the Fall Classic this year? Uh, you're talking about like as a nation, as a baseball fandom. Like, where do you talk? Is it best for baseball. Hmm. I. It's one of them. There's no doubt. If you saw the place, uh, the last couple of days, it was rocking. I think they said that last night they had their biggest crowd since 2013. The atmosphere was incredible. I mean, they gave them good games too. I think that's a very important. Um, yeah. Even when it seemed like the Mets were going to roll into town. Remember, we they had this three game stretch here. Manoa was supposed to be Scherzer and then DeGrom. Obviously, DeGrom didn't end up pitching last night, but the Yankees played some good ball, had a really awesome like end of the game there with Clark Schmidt and, and, and Peralta. So I think a little bit of recency bias with the games, how good they were, will say, yeah, that's great for baseball. I think there's a bunch of good matchups that can come out. I think L.A., the Dodgers versus the Yankees would be incredible. I think uh, the Astros um, versus the Dodgers would be incredible. Um, I think the Cardinals being there against, I don't know, who would the Cardinals face off? That would be really cool. I don't know. There's a lot of good matchups. I do believe the Subway Series is like a top. It's definitely a top three matchup for the game of baseball. I mean, I, a lot of eyes would be glued on that. The last one we did was 2001, if I'm 2000. mistaken. 2000. But it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, both of the old stadiums. They both got new stadiums since there, so we'll create some new memories. I think it's good. I, I like it, obviously, Chris. Yeah, I do think that for our us true baseball fans, I think it would be really, really fun. I think it would be great, because in part because the Yankees and Mets are two of the five best teams in baseball is the way I would look at it. It's these two Dodgers, Astros, and Braves, okay? I think they're all right there, and I think you could make an argument for any two of those five being in there and having it be fun. The problem is, and this is a little inside TV world. The Subway Series, I remember I was working at Fox at the time, and Fox obviously had the World Series, and they were so excited. They're like, the Subway Series this is going to be great. And it was the lowest rated World Series ever at the time. Wow. Lowest rated. And everybody's like, what? You know, because you did have stars, right? You had Mike Piazza. Now, the Mets didn't have nearly the star power that the Yankees had, who were winning their fourth World Series in five years. You know, they had Jeter. They had Clemens. David Cohn was still out there. David Justice was there. So th there's a ton of big names that were partaking. I don't know if people ran into Yankee fatigue at that time or not. I, I don't remember it. Um, I do think that this World Series would do well. Obviously, there are a ton of stars on both sides. And I think having two of them at the top of the Mets rotation would make it must-see TV. Like if it went seven games and you get DeGrom and Scherzer for four of those, that's really helpful. Um, I'd still think Dodgers Yankees would be better for the sport. Yeah. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think Mets Astros would do wonders at all. Honestly, there's not, there's not really many teams in the American league that like are, would be better for baseball than the Yankees. The Yankees but being not, like, whether you want to admit that or not, you know, I, I get a lot of people have, you know, they do have Yankee fatigue and Yankee hate. Uh, they're the best team in the American League that will draw the most fans. Yeah. But but yeah. you know back in two thousand and two thousand, you know we're without social media really largely. Right. So we've been blasted on social media with Yankees, with Mets, with Dodgers. Back in the day, Chris, I mean, you hear it from people all the time. That's why there's a ton of Braves fans and a ton of Cubs fans because these games were on TV. You could actually see these guys play. Um, now with, you know, all the, you know, regional networks that we have and everything like that, everyone's kind of getting their own team. Baseball has become more regional. Um, Yankees Dodgers will probably do best overall for baseball. It would, it would do best. It would cover both coasts. It would cover the two biggest people markets. would hate that too, though. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like Midwesterners. Well, and, I know, uh, but I think that you could, you could also find a team to root against easily. 
you know, and that's part of the that's part of the lure of the Yankees, right? As big a fan base as they have, they're also hated by not just as many people, but more than any. Who's other the team most the likable team? Like, who's the team that everyone's like? Oh, I like that team. That's a great question. That's realistically going to play in the World Series. I mean, you could yeah. probably say the Mariners would be the most likable so, team. I don't no? think I don't think people know enough about them. You have to you have to J-Rod care about the characters. And, yeah. No. You have to care. We, we, sometimes we get caught in our own little bubble, and I don't think that maybe the are the Braves that right now, like the way they play, and I, and I just feel like they are pretty likable, dude. They are. They're 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 a fun team to watch. Uh, I think they're pretty likable. Okay. St. Louis, maybe. Yeah, it's a good. But a lot of people hate St. Louis too, though. <laughs> I know because they they've been so good. I know, but I think people could get on the uh, the train of like Wainwright and Molina's last ride together, and Pujols. Yeah. Obviously, I think people might be able to get on that one. It's a good question. We'll the one point I wanted day. to make, yes, before you change the question, was this just shows you why it's like, hey, let's just get to the dance. Let's just get to the playoffs and see what's going to happen because the Yankees are supposed to get crushed. Okay, like they Scherzer versus Herman. You know, that's the matchup that a lot of people say sure is going to win that one. Um, and then last night, like, Yankees had no relievers available, basically. Montes gave him a decent start. Clark Schmidt comes on in there, throws 60 pitches, mm-hmm. lows the bases. You know, like, Peralta comes in to face Lindor. Like, it was just a gritty, gritty effort by yeah. the Yankees. Like, excellent baseball being played. That double play they turned in the eighth inning with Vogelbach. Like, to be in the shift there, kind of Falefa going to his right, um, Torres having to follow him, catch the ball. Momentum's going the complete opposite way of first base than to turn it like that. I know Vogelbach's running, so that helps. But, like, it was just really good baseball. And just goes to show you, man, like, shit happens in baseball. Baseball is one of those sports where any team can win on any given night. And um, those four games were great. They were really good. If we get treated to a Subway Series that's that competitive, sign me up. I think it'd be great. Uh, very quickly, let's get through this because we talked a little bit about Harper yesterday, but bigger deal, Philly walking it off against Cincinnati after they had blown the lead in the ninth or Harper hitting two home runs in his first rehab game back. It's the easiest question you ever give me. Of course, it's Philly's walking off since here. Are you kidding me? Look, I love Harper. I love the bombs. I love my Lehigh Valley iron pigs. I've been up in those seats by that guitar before too, but that's what Bryce Harper should be doing. He should be crushing kids dreams down in triple A's what he did last night. Uh, Bryson Stott almost walking it off there. We're watching the video now. And then Maton coming up and following him with a pinch hit walk off was awesome. Um, Phillies, they, they got to win every single game right now. I think they're one game up in the wild card for this on the yeah. second wild card. So clearly, this is the most important thing of the night for the Phillies organization. Yeah. As of right now, it's basically four teams for three spots. Although the Braves, in case you haven't noticed, are within two games of the Mets. So it might be, might be the Mets that have to play for that four seed. So there's still going to be a lot of stuff that's going to happen over the final five and a half weeks of the season. Or I guess six weeks from today is when it ends. Um, something like that. I'm not sure of the math, but boy, it's going to be a blast. So fun. Yeah. As, as cool as the Harper stuff was, and it was because we were at the game last night and we're looking at our phones like, my God, Harper hit two. It's unbelievable. And then I was like, yeah, but Philly came back and won after they blew the lead in the ninth. That's a big deal. That's Dude, a bigger if, deal. If you're a big leaguer like Harper, an MVP, like the level between AAA and, and the big leagues can be massive. Depending on who's on the hill, you might find a, a, a pitcher that's just nasty sometimes in AAA. But for the most part, the baseball difference, the level of baseball is is, is pretty different. Yeah, it is. Uh, last thing before we get out of here on the YouTube and the podcast side, uh, very just a cool moment. I think I want to comment about uh, Jordan Alvarez's family saw him play as a big leaguer for the first time. Blumen from Cuba, they were all on hand. Mom, pops, I think his sister was there, perhaps. Um, I think just a really nice story for him. He said that, listen, he's played in the World Series, he said it was the most nervous he had ever been. And I think sometimes those of us that had the good fortune of growing up in this country don't realize what some people do to achieve a dream. And he's achieved it, and I just thought it was a great moment just to share. 
Dude, he's he's incredible. I've been a big fan of his. You know that. And to see this moment was very special. You know, I, I when my parents would come watch me play or my friends would come watch me play, like you do like love those games. It feels like you're a kid again, like when you were just playing in front of them, you know, you kind of forget about the business side of it and you just want to go out there and like you almost want to play well to show them, hey, all your hard work getting me to this point is worth it. You know, you don't you want to go out there and put a show on for them because it is massively a group effort to get a guy to the big leagues. It really is. You hear every single player who comes up that makes a debut say that. Like I had so many people in my corner help me, especially a guy coming from Cuba like this. So uh definitely a cool moment. And I love I love the Alvarez fan. I want to go take hitting lessons from his dad. How about that? Yeah, exactly. Come on. So, bro. I mean, yeah, I think does he take Venmo? <laughs> yeah, um, yes. I'll be in on that. Uh, what do you have coming up on John Boy Media? We uh, Our midweek episode of Talking Baseball is out. We went over some of the rule changes that uh, are happening in AAA. We had a nice long discussion about that. Uh, Jake tried to convince me and Jimmy that the Red Sox organization stinks. And I think him and I fired back a little bit on Jakey Boy there. But definitely a good overall discussion, just kind of about the game and how things are going. What about you? Uh, the hedge episode, the hedgy episode is out. Uh, we gave him a nice ovation there last night. He got a few claps, which was cool. Did he tip his cap uh, to so you? He did not tip his cap. Oh. It was funny though. We hung out with him before the game. He's like, we had a uh, a hedge hedges family viewing party of the latest episode. I was like, oh okay. Did they dig it? Like, oh my mom loves you. She wants to meet you. So we actually went down into the tunnel after the game to try and meet her. And unfortunately, they weren't allowing the families down there last night. He was a little ticked off. So hopefully I'm going to meet the hedges today. Nice. So that would be kind of cool. And then Tyler Glass now is back on the Rose rotation tomorrow. So that is all coming your way. Uh, We'll be back out at uh, Petco Park today. So if you see the roses, say hi, tip a cap, whatever. It'll be fun as always. Uh, I don't believe we're doing baseball today, tomorrow. We've got kind of a wonky, I'm traveling uh you got, got some stuff going on yeah scheduling issue but we are back on friday so do not lose sleep we will be back doesn't mean we don't love you we do just sometimes life gets in the way and we appreciate your understanding for our amazing producer the one and only robbie Shiraco, that is t ploof i am chris rose we will see you friday on baseball today <laughs>